This is really kind of neat. So uh, this miracle is kind of covered slightly different aspects or slightly different accounts, but not at all at odds with each other throughout all the Gospels. In fact, last week, we read what was leading up to this, but last week's Gospel passage at Mass was taken from another Gospel. This week's is taken from John. Now, what I like, what really strikes me as a distinction between last week's And this week's is that if you extend last week's in that particular gospel, you see that there's not the mention of a mountaintop. There's the mention of going into the wilderness. So there's a little broader interpretative possibility, you might say, with the wilderness. Certainly a mountaintop is often found in the wilderness, so they're not at odds with one another. But what strikes me with the mountaintop is the effort it would have taken for these 5,000 to approach our Lord. I mean, presumably. Again, wilderness is a broader genre, and wilderness of any type involves rigor and difficulty, right? But a mountaintop, that's a pretty rigorous thing. It's, it's not a downhill trek. It's an uphill trek. <laughs> And and we don't know maybe how steep or whatever, but certainly it involves some effort. And it's not the effort so much that I think we would do well to focus upon primarily, but the sense of wonder, the sense of awe, the sense of proper intrigue, not curiositas, but wonder and awe wonder and awe. You might say fear of the Lord understood broadly, not as a servile fear, but like, whoa, I stand, wow, I'm blown away. Now, that is not to say that everyone coming up this mountain knew precisely who Jesus was. This is part of the reason he says, hey, keep it on the queue, because they know that this guy's been doing amazing things, and And they know that there can be so much more in store. But they're on a learning curve. They're on a learning curve. Wouldn't it be wild if we could go back and do a survey, like do a a study, if you will, and track each of those 5,000 going forward from this moment on the mountaintop to all kinds of post-resurrection activity? How many of them... We're there at Pentecost. Well, we don't know. We don't have any way to know. How many of them weren't present at any of that stuff, but caught further in information and caught up more fully with the truth of what, it, what was, it had unfolded or what was unfolding at that time when they were on the mountaintop, what was being pointed to now in fulfillment? Whoa, my Lord and my God. Wow, not just my Lord, but my God. That's amazing to think about. And how much we, thank God we can do this. Thank God we occupy a place in history where in some respects we have the rest of the story, although there's also plenty of mystery for us. We know the rest of the story. We know that what is being pointed to here is Jesus' gift of himself, of himself. And this miracle is mind-boggling. I mean, think about it. If, If we saw a quantifiable miracle of this type right now, and it was shown, like, without error, that in fact, this was a quantified miracle, this kind of an expansion of feeding capacity actually took place miraculously, we'd be blown away. We'd be like, wow, that's overwhelming evidence for our faith. What's not as easy to see is that which cannot be quantified through empirical investigation alone, or might be able to be full miracle, but a transubstantial miracle in which the substance of a thing 
without any sort of empirically recognizable shift actually brings about a change in being. To think that every time we come to Mass, the priest participating in a uniquely graced way in the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? And we're doing this together, right? As one mystical body, right? In and th right? This is amazing to think that a flat piece of wheat that looks like a bleached, flattened hockey puck um, becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our risen Lord, of our God. That's wild. That's wild. Protein and carbohydrate, important. Uh, it sustains us. This multiplication, this quantifiable multiplication, right, of um, protein and carbohydrate, fish and loaves, awesome, awesome. It's really going to sustain many. This is a beautiful gift, right? And yet, when we receive this transubstantial reality, a risen Lord and God, he transforms us. He continues to transfigure us in ways that go beyond that which is directly measured, th those things, you might say, that would be directly measurable, but are measurable given the fruits, given the fruits. Uh, things that people see in the faithful. They'll know we are Christians by our love. You could say they'll know we are Christians by our love operationalized. It's things like, uh, the corporal works of mercy, things like the spiritual works of mercy, and, and so on and so forth. The way that gets operationalized as something so much more than that which is quantifiable, and yet the quantifiable points to this source and summit of our lives. Something so rich to think about. Now, I want to close briefly by recognizing something very important so today, it's been decided that we're really going to celebrate, says, grandparents and the elderly. Grandparents and the elderly. Those members of God's mystical body, I'm talking within the church, who have uh, attained an age, a, a, a ripe old age, where uh, they become great resources, so we want to honor them today. And there'll be a point in the liturgy when we have a special blessing. But what I would simply like to remind all of you who are not elderly, all of you who are not grandparents, take advantage. That's probably the best way to honor people who have real wisdom. Not perfect wisdom, right? I mean, uh, but wisdom. It's the old saying, you know, I forget that commercial. Uh, uh, he knows a thing or two or she knows a thing or two because she's seen a thing or two or something like that, you know. There, there's something to be said in that. So if you're younger, right, um, go ahead and figure out how might I better tap into the wisdom of my elders, my grandparents, my parents, uh, so on and so forth, so as to continue to grow in divine wisdom. Tap into that wisdom of the faith that they have lived for so many years. Take advantage. To do otherwise is to sort of not take advantage or to fail to do something or to choose not to do something through which God is going to help you uh, grow in your faith and in operationalizing, how, how you're going to operationalize your faith. A lot of that wisdom is practical, very practical. So take advantage and make sure you show gratitude. That's part of honoring our elders. It's part of honoring our grandparents and our parents. Show gratitude, not attitude in the problematic sense. 
I always like it when younger folks say, oh, people of my generation don't understand. Oh, how wrong you are. <laughs> oh, how wrong you are. Um, no, actually, they do understand. It is you who may not understand. And remember a little distinction in this. Techne and hule. You may have a better technical understanding of something like some little gadget or some little thing, but hule, which has to do with deeper wisdom, you don't have that yet. That's not a slam, that's a reality. That comes with experience. You're still building context. Take advantage. Avail yourselves of the wisdom of those who have more techne than you may realize, but have a whole lot more hule than you do. And as you do that, you'll be so grateful to your elders, and you'll be so grateful to God that you did, in fact, take advantage and show gratitude. Amen.